Our goal with BASE is to build the largest on-chain economy in the world. In that world of 10 L2s, I think that BASE is going to be the largest one of them. Today, we're, we're basically there. We're not quite there from a TVL perspective. The opportunity is massive, and we're going to be able to have a, a really massive impact on both scaling Ethereum and kind of bringing this uh, timeline for the world getting to benefit from this new next generation of the internet forward by years. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Lightspeed. We are joined today by Jesse Pollock, the creator of Base. So we're going to have a good little Base Lana podcast for you guys today. Um, Jesse's the man, so super excited to have you on. Jesse, thanks a ton for joining us. Maybe we can have a good high-level overview to kick things off, and then we'll jump into the technical aspects. Tons of talk about on the technical side, given 4844 uh, in the in Ethereum's Denkun upgrade. So uh, excited for that piece as well. But maybe if we can just kick things off with the origin story for Base. Maybe just talk a little bit about what led you to the decision to launch a chain, and then why choose a roll up over like you know maybe like an uh, an app chain or an L1 like maybe a Avalanche subnet or a Cosmos app chain yep. of these other competing architectures. So why the roll up uh, and then why the OP stack? Awesome. Um, hey, everyone. Excited to be here. I'm Jesse, uh, created Base. Uh, I've actually been in the Coinbase orbit now for a little bit more than seven years. So I, I joined at the beginning of 2017 as an engineer. Uh, I'd started a startup, did that for five years. Uh, it didn't work, but loved crypto, worked with a lot of crypto companies and Coinbase made an offer to acquire us. And so that was kind of my entry point. I uh, joined at the very beginning of 2017. Uh, and spent the next five years kind of taking on more and more responsibility, scaling all of our consumer businesses. Uh, so I started as an engineer, then quickly took on managing a team and then teams of teams. And um, you know, by the end of my time, I was leading all the consumer businesses on, on uh, Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, Coinbase Wallet on the engineering side. Uh, that was awesome. Um, I learned a ton, uh, had a blast. But I think kind of early 2021, um, you know, the, uh, the markets were, were obviously really intense at the time and, and kind of uh, uh, a lot of a lot of froth. And my feeling was that I, I wanted to kind of get back to um, the metal of crypto. I'd spent five years uh, building these consumer interfaces, which were pr predominantly custodial and um, you know predominantly about trading. Uh, but it, it felt to me like if we wanted to enter the next era of crypto that was less speculative, more utility driven, we really need to solve some of these hard infrastructure challenges that could actually unlock that next wave of adoption. And so I uh, took some time off uh, in, the, in the kind of middle of 2021 and then came back to Coinbase uh, late 2021 with this idea of if I could figure out how to work with the rest of the business to bring the business on chain, to move from that kind of custodial off chain product suite that we've had into on chain powered by smart contracts, um, kind of next generation products, uh, that would be a huge impact that I could make on the business. And it would be a huge impact I could make on the world. Because if Coinbase could figure it out, I, I think everyone else could probably figure it out as well. And so thus began our journey towards what eventually became base. Uh, we didn't start, we weren't like, okay, now we need to go build a chain. Uh, we actually started trying to build products. We were like, okay, what's the product that Coinbase can build that's going to make it easier for us to um, kind of gradually start moving the, the company on chain? And we went through four different things. Uh, we we worked, looked at building a, a marketplace where we could kind of uh, help apps identify themselves and reach customers. Uh, we worked, looked at building uh, a advertising infrastructure um, so that apps could you know better reach customers uh, with kind of targeted advertising. Um, uh, and we also uh, built some identity product, uh, where, which eventually became kind of cb.id uh, some of the attestations work the coinbase verifications work that's launched today but was really about okay how do we bring the coinbase identity the coinbase account on chain and all of those were products that we spent about a year building probably like three to four months each um, writing smart contracts kind of working on the ground going to market talking to customers talking to internal teams and i think at every stage we we were seeing two things one was that it was still way too hard to build these products. Um, it wasn't clear where we build them. It wasn't clear how we build them. Coinbase didn't have any infrastructure to actually do that um, because Coinbase had never built any of them before. Uh, so, so that was one thing that really stood out to us. And then the, the second thing that really stood out to us was none of the products felt like the one that was going to make a huge impact. 
we, we kind of built one and then we kind of brought it to market internally and externally and it got kind of tepid responses and that happened a few times. Um, and so those two things were, were kind of this theme through late 2021 and 2022, where it's like we were building a ton, we were using these these products a ton. We weren't finding the kind of product market fit that we wanted to, to really like justify making a bigger investment for the team. But we were seeing that there were a bunch of rough edges around how are we building these products that if we were fit kind of hitting as the, the most crypto native kind of like trendsetters in the business, anyone else who wanted to build an on-chain product would also obviously hit. And so that was the process that we started running in 2022. We started basically thinking holistically about how could Coinbase build a, a paved road for building on chain. And pretty early on, we, we went out and we looked, we said, where are all the developers building today? Uh, we saw that the, the vast majority from a numbers perspective were building on EVM. From an assets perspective, uh, you know, Ethereum was still far and away the largest economy. Uh, and so that felt like the, the logical place for us to kind of focus our efforts from a paved road perspective. Um, and then I think when we looked at, okay, the scale that Coinbase wanted to build at, you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, it was clear that we couldn't do that on L1. Um, it just wouldn't sustain the, the scale that we were operating at be way too expensive, more way too expensive for our customers, uh, and so then we drilled in. We said, okay, we're going to have to build it L2 uh, if we want to use EVM, if we want to kind of tap into the broader Ethereum economy. And once we identified that, then it was just the process of figuring out how and where we build there. And I think as we met with teams and as we built our own intuitions around this, one of the things that um, kind of clarified for us was that in the Ethereum ecosystem, rather than there just being one monolithic L2, it was actually going to be much more likely that I ended up with many of these things that were kind of operating in parallel, scaling Ethereum collectively, almost like the original scale, scaling vision of Ethereum, where you have 64 shards, there might be 64 rollups that are working together to scale Ethereum and kind of provide that capacity. And as that kind of perspective shifted for us from one L2 to, oh, there's going to be many of these things. I think that really opened up the possibility for us of doing one ourselves because we were seeing we need this paved road. Uh, we need to provide a toolkit for our engineers and create a rallying call for the business to move on chain. And there's going to be many of these things and an opportunity for Coinbase to contribute to this scaling mission. And so in late 2022, after a bunch of failure, after actually them shutting down the team that I was working on, uh, because we hadn't found product market fit, uh, me and a couple of people kind of rose from the ashes and said, let's give this one more shot. And we built the first internal prototype of base, which at the time was called BaseNet. Um, uh, and people started using it uh, and we kind of were off to the races from there. And so that was December uh, when we really decided to go in on this. We launched the test net in February. Uh, we launched the, the main net in um, August. Uh, and uh, today, you know, base, I think is, is starting to establish itself as the market leading L2. Uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we, we, there's been the most DEX volume on base. There's been the most users on base. There's been the most transactions on base. I think you're seeing pretty much every app launch on base uh, today. And um, I, I think that energy and excitement for us being eight months in uh, is pretty remarkable. And so it's been, been quite the journey. I want to now take us back to, I think, what was your second or third question, which is how did we decide to um, build on the OP stack? Uh, and, and that was a thing that we spent a lot of time thinking about. You know, we, we spent six to 12 months basically meeting with all these teams, understanding their technology stacks, um, understanding their culture, their approach, their strategy. Uh, and I think four things really stood out to us about, about optimism in the OP stack. The first was that we we really convinced ourselves that the technology was the right technology stack for what we were trying to do. Uh, it was built in a way where it was relatively modular, uh, where they were really thinking about the end game of layer twos, which is the stage two decentralization, and building the stack in such a way where it'd be easy to have multiple execution clients, it'd be easy to have multiple kind of consensus nodes, uh, and that would let us get to these multi-provers that I think are really important for a L2 security model in the long term. So, so that was the first thing, kind of, we believed in the technology, we felt like that was the right thing for us to line to. The, the second thing was uh, the approach to licensing and open source. Uh, we've believed from the beginning that the open on-chain economy has got to be, be decentralized. It's got to be open source. And optimism kind of leading with this MIT license, uh, something that anyone could build on, that anyone could fork, 
felt really aligned to how we thought about it. Um, it, it also let us get started building on the OP stack without even thinking about it. Uh, we built and launched the first version of uh, uh, Base um, without talking to Optimism. We eventually went and did a deal that we can talk about with them to kind of make sure we had a governance voice. But that open source nature of the, the technology, I think, was really important to giving us that kind of uh, freedom to go and get started and also is, is really aligned to our ethos and how we think about crypto. The, the third thing that, that kind of uh, drove us there was, I think when we thought about the skill set and the strengths that Coinbase had, you know, we're a scaled, centralized corporation. And that's really great for a lot of things. And I think we're seeing a lot of that execution muscle come through with base. But one of the things that's not great is for decentralization, for on-chain governance. Like we've never done that before. And I think that's something where uh, optimism really spikes. Like they're very strong. They've been thinking about governance. They've been thinking about decentralization for a long time. And they've been building what I think is some of the most innovative governance structures on chain. And so that complement where Coinbase could bring the kind of centralized, scaled muscle and optimism could complement us with the decentralization and the governance ethos and approach and expertise felt like it would it would really work well together and that we could do a lot if we were kind of putting our uh, arms together and building. Uh, and then the, the fourth thing, which um, you know I, I think is a, a thing that uh, a lot of us get to experience day to day is we just liked working with the team. Uh, you know, we'd actually started working with them a, a year and a half prior on EIP 4844, which is this big upgrade to Ethereum before we conceived of base, uh, before we conceived of building our own layer two, we just had this desire to scale Ethereum and this felt like the right place to do it. And optimism and OP labs were right there alongside us. Uh, and so we had a year of being in the trenches, writing code, uh, shipping real fundamental infrastructure improvements. So we knew that they were really strong engineers. We knew that we had kind of similar visions for uh, you know how all this technology should work, and I think that gave us the trust uh, alongside the technology alignment, the, the the licensing and open source alignment, and the the kind of complement uh, from the governance and decentralization side to really lean in and and kind of commit to becoming a core developer on the OP stack, joining as a part of the super chain, and I think believing and building in this kind of better together future for scaling Ethereum. Cool. That was a lot. One thing that actually uh, caught my attention there is you said um, at first you guys thought that maybe it would be like there would be like one big L2 um, or maybe like two big L2s. And then you gradually realized maybe it's actually going to be multiple and maybe you're gonna, it's going to be scaling in parallel. That's yeah. actually uh, – that seems to be a relatively contentious topic within Ethereum. Some people think there's going to be a lot of roll-ups. Some people think there's going to be like two or three big ones. In fact – Ryan Wyatt, who is now, I think, president at OP, I, he was on this podcast before and he said he thinks it might be like one or two dominate everything. Um, where do you, how do you see base coming into this? Do you think base will be like the one or two big general L2s that everybody will build on? Or do you think it'll be more focused going forward? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say my like mental model for this is is relatively informed by the the history of Ethereum scaling, which is if you look at kind of what you actually need to get to from a TPS perspective to serve billions of people, um, it's pretty big. And then if you look at the kind of like execution environment of a single compute environment like a EVM chain, uh, you can push it pretty hard. And we'll talk about that later. You know, our goal for base is to, to work towards a gig gas a second, which, you know, can get us to, to like hundreds of millions of users. I feel pretty confident. Um, and maybe we can push that further to like 10 gig gas or something. But if we really want to have billions of people or, or trillions of agents, if we have all these AI agents on chain, I think that you do end up uh, needing to do horizontal sharding at the, the L2 layer. And I think that that's going to get us to maybe not thousands of L2s, but definitely tens of L2s. Um, and then likely, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or millions of L3s that, are, that I really think about as just like on-chain connected servers or on-chain connected databases that are running off those L2s. And my rough mental model is that L2s are going to kind of end up being these economic zones, uh, almost like a, a nation state today, where you have this really big macro economy that is basically like a society that has, has sov sovereignty, that ha has governance, that has a culture that develops off of it. Um, and I don't think there's like, 
thousands of those that will exist. But I do think that there's probably enough space for tens. Um, and some of them are definitely going to be bigger. Like, you know, the United States is the largest economy in the world. But uh, I think there are going to be on the order of tens of these that, are, that end up being really material. Um, and then I, I think the the layer below that, like the L3 layer, I think more about like, like it's app specific zones where they're trying to kind of scale out one specific app, one specific use case. And for them, it doesn't make sense to do all of the like society building that a macroeconomic zone needs to do. Instead, they actually just want to plug into that. They want to get the on and off ramps. They want to get the governance. They want to get the culture. They want to get a lot of the liquidity access to the economy, but then have their own special zone where they're actually going to be scaling their execution and bringing more and more of their user base on chain. And so that that's kind of where we are today. I'd say that you know, my thinking on this is constantly evolving. Uh, and even uh, a year and a half ago, like when we were thinking about launching base, I didn't have a conception of L3s. I actually thought that there were going to be more L2s and that it was going to be more kind of like uh, homogenous and scaled at the L2 layer. But I think as we've seen some of this develop, um, my shifting has started to think, uh, my thinking has started to shift a little bit. I'd say I, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that there's going to be fewer like macroeconomic zones and then many, many, many scaled app zones. Okay. So uh, a, a few, you know, let's say on the order of 10s L2s and then many L3s um, for some of those L2s. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and, and then I, you asked about kind of like how base is going to fit into this. You know, like our goal with base is to build the largest on-chain economy in the world. Um, and, and we want to build a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And so in that world of 10 L2s, I think that base is going to be the largest one of them. I think, you know, today we're, we're basically there. We're, we're not quite there from a TVL perspective, just given we've been around for so much shorter than a lot of the other players. But um, on all the activity metrics, I think we're there. And I think we're just going to keep scaling from here. And so, um, you know, that is our North Star. It's to build a global on-chain economy that, that brings the world on-chain, uh, that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And I think if we do that successfully, the opportunity is massive and we're going to be able to have a, a really massive impact on both scaling Ethereum and kind of bringing this uh, timeline for the world getting to benefit from this new next generation of the internet forward by years. One thing I'm curious about, maybe on an engineering side, is um, to, to scale uh, the OP stack because it's single-threaded, um, you guys need to add L3s for uh, state isolation, right? So these each have their own kind of uh, dedicated space. So yep. that they're not affected by spikes in the other places, uh, other users on the L2. Um, the other approach to this was, of course, doing it on the L2 and maybe using like an alt VM, um, or really you could repurpose the EVM as well, like a monad or something. Have you guys thought about that internally um, at all, using like alternate VMs um, and scaling a bit more at the L2? Yeah, I, so you know, our medium-term goal right now, like I said, is one giga gas a second, which is basically a measurement of throughput. Um, uh, and you know, when we started kind of this execution scaling mission, we were at two point five million gas a second, uh, and so it's four hundred x from 2.5 to 1,000 uh, million gas, which is a giga gas a second. And that's kind of what we think about as a medium term goal, which I, I like to think about as like 12 to 24 months. Um, uh, there's a bunch of challenges that we need to solve in there. I think our thesis is that for that level of scaling, for getting that 400x, we can mostly do, or we, we can almost certainly do it um, without uh, massively changing the EVM. So I, I think we're, we may need to do some kind of like just in time uh, optimistic parallelization, like you're seeing folks like, you know, Mega ETH do. Um, there may be some changes that we need to do around, uh, around when you're kind of like calculating the state route, whether you can do that in like a trailing uh, basis or you need it at, at the time every block is created. And, and Monad's been doing interesting things there. But I think our thesis is that we can generally keep the same shape uh, as the EVM uh, to get there over the next two years. And obviously, there's a ton of hard work. Uh, we need to execute the crap out of this, and, and uh, that's going to be hard. But we think there's a path there. I think scaling beyond that is where you have to think a little bit more about, like, can you have isolated state in the EVM? Like, could we, you know, mandate access lists? Um and use that to do more state, state isolation, um, uh, you know, kind of multivariable fee markets. Uh, I think all of that's possible. And one of the things that I do expect to happen is that we will see 
um, more experimentation at the L2 VM than at the uh, L1 VM in Ethereum. I think that that's good and healthy. And you know, one of the things I've been really challenging our team to to do is like think outside the box uh, while also figuring out like how do we keep compatibility and alignment. And so I'd say as we work through the next 12 to 24 months of what I would consider like pure execution, get us to that 400x. In parallel, we are working on what I would consider more like research challenges, which are basically like to get beyond that 400x, to get beyond one gig of gas a second. What are the big research challenges? Uh, what do they mean for compatibility across uh, RL2 and other L2s, across L1 and L2? Um, and how do we kind of like wrangle them in the right way that balances getting those scaling outcomes that we want while also making sure that we're providing a consistent platform for developers that um, kind of gives them the, 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 the ease and expectations that they're looking for. Um, and I think we're going to be able to solve that. One thing that I do um, really believe in is that at L3, I think we're going to see massive experimentation. Because the way I think about L3s is they're basically just servers uh, that plug in to uh, on-chain environment. And so you can get more of the kind of like open, uh, permissionless, verifiable compute that on-chain gives you, but you can still have all of this customization. And so just like with, you know, the Web2 era where you see people running really, really diverse kinds of servers, uh, whether that's the hardware, people running their own hardware or, or kind of doing the shared hardware on AWS or the software, people using different languages, the VMs, like I think we're going to see the same massive experimentation at L3. And my hope is that, that's going to actually be really generative because we're going to see people run these VMs and, and we're going to see people, you know, run the SVM L3 on base and the move VM L3 on base and the parallel EVM on, on base. And all of that's going to kind of like push the limits of what's possible. And then we're going to be able to take all of those learnings that are on open source because that's the kind of like ethos of crypto. And we're going to be able to kind of identify which are the ones that find that sweet spot between getting us the scaling outcomes that we want and preserving that interoperability, letting developers kind of have those the, those kind of trust guarantees that they're looking for. And we're going to bring them to base and we're going to bring them to other L2s. And I, I love that sort of um, diversity of different approaches. We kind of let a thousand flowers bloom and then we pick the right ones that we think are, are kind of right in that sweet spot and, and we maximize uh, how much impact they can have by bringing them to this kind of middle L2 layer that still really cares about composability, still really cares about decentralization, um, but is willing to kind of push harder and make different changes than you're going to make it a, an L1 for Ethereum. Well, one thing I'm curious about uh, is, um, so like, for, for example, if you take the L3 approach, um, there's obviously some sort of cascading effect on the L2 and then the L1. Let's say, um, uh, you know, one of these apps really takes off and they suddenly start caring much more about... Um, not like degen or anything, but like maybe something a bit more financialized, uh, like lending a protocol, for example. And maybe they care about real time censorship resistance and whatnot. And maybe they need to they need some guarantees from the L two. How how do you guys think about the decentralization of the sequencer? Because I know some people believe you shouldn't even try to decentralize the L two sequencer. Some people think you should. So there's varying approaches here. What is your guys' approach on um, those yep. guarantees? Yeah, I'd say that our like where we are in the sequencer decentralization life cycle is very much at the research phase. Um, there's a bunch of things happening in parallel. So we've run a, we're running a RFP that that's open. That's kind of looking at doing uh, round robin sequencing. Um, that's been happening with the OP Foundation. Uh, obviously, we've been closely following what Espresso has been doing with their kind of sequencing model. Um, I, I've been talking a lot with the Ethereum Foundation and Justin Drake and those folks about base sequencing uh, and and uh, the, the pathway there. And I think I'm I'm very optimistic about that path. Um, and so I think we're kind of in the expansive research. You know, let a thousand flowers bloom right now. Because when I think from a priority perspective, as we think about decentralization, um, the, the top priority for us is getting fault proofs live, uh, which hopefully should happen very, sh very shortly. Um, uh, making sure the, the Security Council model uh, is, is really mature, uh, uh, that it's kind of well de decentralized, uh, geographically decentralized, that it has those kind of uh, timing uh, parameters set up in such a way that users have the ability to withdraw if they kind of disagree with the pathway that L2 is taking. Um, and so that for us is kind of the P0. It's the execution 
pathway that we're really pushing on in 2024. And then in parallel, I'd say we're doing kind of the early research work to kind of let that experimentation happen with the the decentralized sequencing. And then as we enter 2025, I think that's going to become more of a priority for us. Because I think to, to the point that you're making, um, right now, a lot of the L3s that we are kind of seeing still kind of look like toys. Um, you know, people kind of look at them and like, what, what's, the, what's the point of this? Um, but in a world where you actually take a huge percentage of uh, Web2 compute and you bring it on chain as L3s, um, uh, you know, I think just like out of the box that will have some benefits versus Web2 compute. Like it's going to be open. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, uh, more verifiable for everyone, but there's also going to be drawbacks. And I think in a lot of ways, it's going to still look like Web2 compute from a control, from a permission perspective today, if we just you know adopted the technology as it is. And so I think as that platform matures, as it gets more usage, I think it's going to be really important that we keep pushing both the decentralization, uh, the, the security and the, the kind of flexibility that developers have as they're building out these kind of more dedicated solutions to make sure that they can both uh, provide great products that users want to use, that users love, but also do that in such a way where they're not putting users at risk of a lot of the failure modes that we've seen with you know centralized exchanges, uh, kind of off-chain products that, that have cropped over the last 10 years and even before that in, in the kind of like Web2 world. So is it fair to say that you're kind of like understanding or your, your mental model, I should say, of this is, you know, today we have Ethereum L1 general purpose chain wants anything to be built on it. And we're putting L2s on top of that that also have the same general purpose um, vision, but it's, it's justified with, hey, we got to scale this thing, right? Uh, yep. You know, 15 TPS isn't going to cut it. Uh, and these L2s are, are building that path. And then the L3s instead of being like a third layer of this general purpose vision, it's more of like this app specific of like, hey, we want to do this XYZ purpose. Um, and it's we need this isolated space to go do it. And is that kind of how you think about this? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like Ethereum is going to be maximally decentralized. It's going to be maximally censorship resistant. It's going to be that base layer. And then on top of that, you're going to have L2, which is like, you know, slightly less decentralized, decentralized but still able to bootstrap off of the, the infrastructure that Ethereum provides. But it's also going to be this general purpose compute that I think most people are going to onboard to. Like, I don't think everyday people are going to onboard to Ethereum. I think they'll onboard directly to L2. And then L3, um, you know, and, and this is why like a lot of people say like, oh, base is Ethereum. Like, because in many ways, like you can even imagine a world where all of this kind of just gets like pulled up into Ethereum eventually. Uh, and that becomes this kind of like macro L1, L2 that gives the same trust characteristics across all of it. But then I don't think that that's going to happen for L3. I think at least not on nearly as fast a timeline. Like L3 is going to be this experimentation zone. It's going to be super, super uh, heterogeneous. It's going to be really diverse. You're going to have people that really want to have different trust characteristics. For instance, I think people are going to build L3s that are essentially have the same trust characteristics as Web2 products, um, but they get to bootstrap off of the identity that's on-chain on L2. They get to bootstrap off the assets that are on-chain on L2 uh, and build them using this new technology platform to help them move faster. I also think you're going to have L3s that have almost the same trust characteristics as L2s or L1, and that kind of push out really far on the decentralization uh, kind of uh, spectrum uh, and, and really kind of make it have similar guarantees. And I think that that experimentation is very good. It's very healthy. Uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do to educate developers to to kind of make sure that they are um, building things in such a way that don't mislead or uh, kind of abuse the trust that users have from moving through L1 to L2 to L3. But I think all of that is possible. Um, I think that it, it's going to be uh, made possible by the fact that all these systems, for the most part, are going to be open source. Uh, and that means that we're going to be able to build all of this infrastructure to inform, educate, and hold accountable the different parties that are building this. And I think a great example of this is how it's playing out on L2 right now. Like you can go to L2 beat right now and you can see how is every L2 tracking against the decentralization goals. Uh, and that means that you have people on Twitter who get to say, say base is a stage zero roll up. If base is a stage zero roll up at the end of the year, I'm not going to keep using it. And we have that accountability where it's like, okay, you're going to see our progress every quarter. Did we make progress? Are we talking the talk or are we, are we also walking the walk? And I think that characteristic of these blockchains, that they are open by default um, and that anyone can build these kind of verification systems on top of them that hold us accountable is super, super important. And it's going to be the thing that allows us to have that heterogeneity at L3 while also uh, building it in a way that's trusted that users and developers can actually rely on. While we're, um, that just reminded me, um, spicy question, so get ready. Um, 
for uh, talking about security councils, okay. Um, wh- one thing I'm curious about, which I haven't gotten an actual answer on, really. So Tolly argues that uh, on Twitter, at least, that um, he doesn't think Altus will actually ever get rid of the security council or the or the multi sig because there's always a, a case where you need to do an emergency upgrade for like a security issue. Some people disagree with that. Like I think Aztec disagrees. Um, so one, I'm I'm curious on what you think about or what maybe you think basis path should be on the on the security council multi-sig. The other is a specific question. This is a spicy one. Okay. Uh, we saw um, uh, Blast, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows what I'm going to talk about, uh, get, uh, I mean, Blast didn't get attacked. The protocol on Blast got attacked, let's say, by North Korean alleged uh, official uh, or, or person. And uh, there was talk of Blast rolling this back, right? Because they kind of have to do it. Uh, or maybe they have to do it. I'm just kind of speculating. Um, uh, I think maybe the day after around that, I also saw, um, uh, somebody from Coinbase post that the funds for customers, um, USDC specifically would be on base progressively. I think like some of them, not all yeah. of them in the event of something like, like an exploit on, on L2, like the base, what, what do you, what would base have to do in that case? Um, just, just for like, um, cause I'm, I'm actually quite curious, um, and and maybe I want to actually ask that question from two. Like I think right now it's quite clear what the answer would be, but maybe in like five six years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So first on the Security Council, um, you know, I I think that what we'll see is we'll basically see a, a progressive descoping of responsibility and agency for the Security Council um, as these systems harden. And so today, like if you look at the the Security Council that we're building, um, they're going to have the ability to upgrade. <laughs> Uh, kind of the the chain. You you have a like diverse security council set. I think it's like twelve signers. They're geographically distributed. Um, you know they have you know legal obligations. They have contractual obligations. Um, uh, but their their permissions are uh, um, uh, still relatively wide in what they can do. Um, while also being uh, relatively time bound. So they can only do certain things on, on certain time horizons. So like upgrading the chain, well, I think it's like seven days or 14 days delay, uh, which is enough time for users to pull out uh, and actually get to kind of the, the safety of L1 if they want to. Um, and, and so I'd say that that's like, uh, obviously a huge step from where we are today. Like today, the the upgrade uh, for, for base is um, a two of two that actually has two kind of sub security councils inside of it. Uh, it has the like Coinbase controlled one and then has an optimism controlled one. They're both big, I think like four of six or six of eight or something like that, um, that uh, make it so there's no single party that has the ability to upgrade. Like Coinbase can't do it independently. Uh, neither could Optimism. You actually need this kind of uh, consensus. But moving to the, the next stage security council, which is more diverse, uh, more distributed, has this time lock. Uh, I think all that's a big step forward. I think where we'll go from uh, there is that we're going to continue widen, widening the security council. So it'll go from you know 12 actors to more actors. Um, we're going to continue uh, increasing the time time delay uh, so that they, they, it takes them longer and longer to act um, when they need to act. And then I think most importantly, we'll, we'll continue de-scoping their responsibility. So they'll move from having the ability to upgrade the system to having the ability to upgrade components of the system uh, or to uh, kind of participate in certain components of the verification. Uh, like if there are multiple provers, like uh, two optimistic provers or an optimistic prover and a ZK prover, uh, and those things disagree, then the Security Council has an opportunity to participate. And so I, I don't know exactly where we will end up there, but I'd say that our goal is to get to stage two, um, which is at a point where we basically de-scoped those permissions of the Security Council so significantly that the um, guarantees that you, you can give users are essentially the same as Ethereum. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of learning on, on the way there, uh, but that's definitely what we're pushing to. And I think it's very possible. Uh, it just requires is moving really deliberately uh, because the, the systems that we're working with right now are massively scaled. Um, you know, like there's four billion dollars on base, and you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you move too quickly, and that leads to customer fund loss or, or anything like that. And so um, that's how I think about the, the security qu- council que- question. Uh, I'm happy to go into to more there. Uh, actually, any questions about that, and then I can jump to the other one. That makes sense to me. 
Yeah. Um, and then jumping to the, the blast situation, uh, obviously a really interesting uh, uh, kind of scenario that we, we saw play out. And, um, uh, you know, from the beginning of base, uh, we've done uh, everything we can to structure the network in such a way that it's open and permissionless. Uh, so, you know, you, we, we've written a blog post about it, but th- that was like basically a, a, a requirement for us launching this thing. We, we knew that we needed uh, to build an open and permissionless system if we wanted to uh, create a global on-chain economy that increases innovation and creativity and freedom. And so what that led to in our decision-making processes was uh, leaning into decentralization from the beginning. So going back to the Security Council, uh, we could have structured base such that uh, Coinbase would be a unilateral actor where they could upgrade the systems. That's not how we structured it. Instead, we uh, structured it so that there's this two of two where there's no unilateral actor. Uh, we co-wrote this thing called the law of chains, uh, which is basically a neutrality framework that explicitly calls out um, uh, how important it is to re- remain uh, retain this open permissionless character characteristic at the the L2 and base. And we basically set up a governance structure that in the event of violation of the law of chains, um, uh, Coinbase or other participants in the super chains uh, operations could be removed as participants. Uh, And so all of that was basically designed so that as we... um, uh, kind of continued down this path for progressive decentralization and got to greater and greater software guarantees of that decentralization. Uh, in the interim, we would have uh, contractual guarantees, uh, we would have uh, social public commitment guarantees, uh, and we would have uh, you know multi-sig guarantees that actually enforced that open permissionless nature of the chain. And so that's our starting point. Um, base is open and permissionless. Uh, it's also decentralized uh, to, to a degree where it's able to achieve that characteristic, and it's going to be decentralizing even further in the years ahead as we work to stage one and then stage two. Um, so that's kind of where we're starting point. That's kind of the the the, the way we approach any of uh, these kind of problems as we think about uh, solving them. Now, to the, the specific question around USDC and um, BASE, uh, I think it's really important to segment out the open permissionless nature of BASE uh, and the nature of USDC, which is a totally separate thing. Uh, and USDC is, is managed by Circle. Um, uh, you know, there's actually a, a track record both on the USDC side uh, and the the Tether side and many other, you know, centrally managed stable coins where, uh, you know, if they've gotten court orders, uh, they've actually frozen funds. Um, uh, and, and I think that that is uh, for a collateralized U.S. stablecoin um, that is kind of moving towards a world where we're actually going to have policy frameworks that I think will kind of uh, enshrine that in the, the U.S. economy. Um, I, I think that that's a reasonable expectation uh, at the stablecoin side. And so w- how exactly that would play out, I, I don't know. And I'm not going to kind of get into the specific details, but I do think it's really important for us to distinguish those things. Like base is going to remain open and permissionless. It's going to in- inherit the same decentralized characteristics as Ethereum, and we're going to fight really, really hard for that. Stablecoins uh, built on top of base and any other asset built on top of base are going to have different trust and security characteristics, and they're going to operate differently from base. And the way they may respond to uh, you know, exploits or hacks is, is going to be different and will likely be more trusted and more aligned to the governmental system that they're operating in uh, than the open, permissionless, global nature of the underlying network. No, that, that, that all makes sense to me. I kind of want to change tune a little bit. You just mentioned how, you know, you can imagine a world where there's like a, the fraud proofs as well as ZK proofs. And, you know, we talked a lot about on this pod already. There'll be tens of L2s. There'll be L3s on top of those L2s. And at the end of the day, this is just creating a web of blockchains as, as, as simple as possible. And there'll need to be asset transfer or message communication between those blockchains. Now, the polygon aggregation layer and the you know, ZK Sync has a similar solution uh, with the ZK stack and, and hyperchains over there. Like, There's multiple teams building out these proof ag- aggregation layers that kind of facilitate this richer bridging or easier communication between L2s and L3s. How do you guys think about that? And do you find that to be like a necessary end state or somewhere we'll end up? Or is there like a different alternative here? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And, and we definitely think that interoperability between L2s and L3s is going to be super important. Like it, it's going to let us provide um, more uh, seamless experiences, both for developers and users. Um, now, I, I, I'd say that I don't think that it's strictly required, at least in the short term. Like already we're seeing people build pretty seamless experiences across multiple L2s. Like if you look at the smart wallets that are starting to emerge, where you have balance consolidation, um, where you're doing kind of these intent-based uh, bridging models, like it, it gets 
gets pretty seamless, but uh, I think that there is uh, more we can push it uh, if we kind of go down this path of creating interoperability between L2s. The, the way I think about interoperability at a high level is that there's, there's actually two kinds of interoperability that are important. Um, one is what I think about as kind of like asset fungibility, which is basically, can you create assets that can seamlessly move across L2s without introducing new trust assumptions? Uh, and so a great example of this is, uh, you know, thinking about OP mainnet and base. Today, OP mainnet uh, issues the OP token. Uh, we can't get it on base. Someone has bridged it with Axelar. Uh, so there's like AXL OP, but that introduces a new trust assumption. Now, if you want to use OP on base, you also need to trust Axelar's security model that they're not going to get hacked and it's not going to lead to kind of the, something happening to Axel OP. And I love Axelar, I love all these teams, but introducing new trust assumptions uh, is uh, basically introducing fragility to these systems. Uh, and so I think one of the most important forms of interoperability that we think about is what we call like, asset fungibility, which is basically, can we get those assets moving across these chains in a way where there's no new trust assumptions? And so uh, ideally in this new future, we have OP that can move from OP to, to base, to, to Zora network, to mode, and you have the same trust assumptions across all those. So that's asset fungibility uh, as kind of one form of interoperability that's really important. The, the second form of interoperability that, that's really important is uh, what I would consider like um, uh, kind of like Execution, like synchronous execution, like can you basically get a single block uh, syn synchronous execution across multiple state zones? So like in one block, can I execute a transaction that executes on base and executes on OP mainnet and does something there? Now, for me, from a starting point perspective, I'd say that I'm actually, at least today, much more focused on the asset fungibility side of things than the uh, execution interoperability side of things. And that's not because I don't think the the uh, execution fun, uh, interoperability stuff is important. It's absolutely important. It's something that we're pushing on. But I think that the economic outcomes that asset fungibility unlock are actually much, much bigger. And in particular, when you have L2s, uh, if you want to be doing uh, kind of economic transactions across them and you don't have asset fungibility, you end up always needing to go through the L1 uh, for capital movements. And that's really, really capital intensive. So like, let's say I want to bridge from base to OP mainnet. I can fast bridge using one of these tools. But what that requires is basically having a pool of capital on both sides. And every time you want to rebalance or update that pool of capital, you have to do seven day wait, which is a really expensive from a capital kind of management perspective. And what asset fungibility gets you is it basically gets you able to do that instantly, which makes the economic uh, kind of zones much more tightly integratable. And I think that's going to lead to a ton of um, economic activity between these zones that otherwise wouldn't happen because of those cap like capital inefficiency. And so if you want asset fungibility, at some point, you're going to need to have a shared root of trust. Whether you're using an optimistic construction or using a ZK construction, you're going to need all of these chains to opt in to say, hey, we have some shared root of trust that basically lets us have shared bridge balances across these chains so that you can fungibly move the assets across them and users can withdraw from any of them. And I think that that shared root of trust is actually the hard problem. The technology is hard, but it's mostly an execution challenge. And there's tons and tons of people who are open source building this technology, but getting a bunch of different chains that are coming from different backgrounds, that have different perspectives, to opt in to a shared root of trust is incredibly challenging. And this is what the super chain is. This is what optimism is doing. This is the fundamental innovation. It's saying, hey, can we build something that's bigger together than as any of us as individuals? And can we get people to actually opt into a shared root of trust that all of us believe in, that all of us kind of work towards, that allows us to get that interoperability? And I think if we can do that, which I think we're starting to see happen with OP Mainnet and Base and Zora and WorldCoin and Farcaster and all these other incredible products, then what technology we use to execute that, to make it so we have that asset fungibility, uh, so that it's faster, so it's more capital efficient, we can change over time. If it works great to start with optimistic version of that, uh, and we have a prototype of interop and a whole specification that I think we'll make progress on this year, that's great. But then if we get faster, better version of that from a ZK ag layer, 
that's also great. But I, I think that people sometimes uh, kind of focus on the wrong things. And for me, my sense is that the, the hardest thing is actually getting people to opt in to a different trust model where it's shared rather than trying to just solve a specific technology problem. Uh, so, so I'd say that that's there on the, the interoperability side. On the um, kind of per, per block execution side, I think you basically have similar challenges. I'm less deep there. Uh, I've been following the work that Espresso has been doing. I've been following the stuff that's been happening with base rollups. Um, I think you end up like kind of running into similar questions around trust. But I also think that there's versions of that uh, kind of execution interop where you don't need any trust. Um, where you can literally just kind of do bulk auctioning of these blocks and then let builders execute across all of them at the same time. And so my sense is that we'll actually see um, these these kind of be solved in parallel where you have that like execution interoperability being solved in a relatively trustless way where people are opting in uh, in like a, a non-exclusive manner to have their blocks co-built with other chains in a way that lets people execute faster. Um, but then the asset interoperability is the thing that ends up being really hard, where you need people to have some more shared trust. And that the, the kind of networks of chains that are going to be most successful are going to be the ones that solve the interoperability challenge, which then gives the uh, execution uh, a challenge much more power because now you can do a lot more with it and you have a lot more capital efficiency. So it's really interesting to me that you mentioned uh, that the harder part is kind of this 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 opt-in side of, of getting people to agree on a standard, right? Because uh, to me, it's if you look at the OP, OP stack and the super chain and the Optimism Collective, they've said, hey, we're going to build out this uh, this scalable framework for everyone to kind of build on top of. They made it, the, they use the MIT license, so it's open source, free and permissionless to use, um, and they kind of spread it everywhere. And then now they're like, okay, now it's time to start thinking about interop, right? Now we have this network of chains that all want to communicate with each other, right? You mentioned Zora, Base, OP Mainnet, Mode, right? And there, there's many more as well. And so that's like the opposite approach of you know what Polygon or, or ZK Sync are doing, where they say, hey, we're going to, ZK Proof is our hardest shit, and we're going to figure that out, and then we're going to go try to, you know, rally up the troops and get everyone to build on our network. And I have no opinion on which one's the right way to do it or if there even is an answer to the, the right way. Uh, it's just a very interesting observation to me to see like totally. the leading market participants kind of just so going to the same end state but going two different routes to get there. It's very, very interesting. It's a different strategy. And I think if you, if you go and talk to builders who are building on the OP stack, um, uh, and building as part of the, the the collective, like the thing that you'll primarily hear is is not oh we chose this because we, it's the best technology. Although I think people think that and they think they see the path. They they mostly say we chose this because we want to be a part of this, and that's really really different. And that's trust. That is trust. That's basically saying we are choosing to build alongside these other people because we believe in them. And even if we might compete in certain ways, even if, you know, at times our network's going to look and be like a little bit, you know, competitive with base, we know, we trust, we want to build together. And that foundation of trust, that is the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing. It's why you have all of this kind of, uh, uh, you know, competition and uh, dunking and, uh, you know, craziness that happens on the internet because people don't trust each other. And instead, what I think is you're seeing emerge in the Optimism Collective is a context where people actually do trust each other. And what that's going to unlock, I don't think people are ready for, um, because it does break some of these mental models where I think a lot of people are very oriented around how do we just build the best technology? And if we build the best technology, everything else will be handled for us. And I just don't think that's the way the world works. The way the world works is you bring people together, you make them believe in something, you make them believe in each other, and then you can accomplish anything. And that's that's the whole thing about the super the super chain. It's stay optimistic. It's be based. Uh, it's work together. It's it's work hard and it's create something that's bigger than any one of us. Cool. Um, I'm gonna maybe be a bit more nerdy now. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, <laughs> I I would say um, one thing I'm curious about actually while we're talking about trust is um, m mostly curious actually. Um, Assuming that base, um, and it seems like you guys have a path for fixing execution scaling, um, yeah. at, at some point, you're going to run into the ultimate bottleneck, which is going to be DA, right, yeah. um, for scaling. And DA is a weirdly controversial topic. Um, and you guys are obviously currently using Ethereum, right, 4844 uh, with, with that upgrade. Um, but then there's obviously, I think DGEN is using Arbitrum Many Trusts. I believe, and there's Avail, there's Celestia, there's Eigen DA coming soon. Assuming, like maybe hypothetical experiment, 
assuming that you fixed the execution scaling and then now DA is the big bottleneck, how would you think about DA and would you care about the different trust assumptions there? Like, what is the mental model there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, and this is actually a question that we anticipated like two years ago, even before we started building base. Uh, we basically identified, hey, DA is the next big bottleneck for L2s. Let's start working on a long time horizon to solve it. And so back in March 2022, we started working on 4844. Uh, that turned into a two-year project. Um, we built the first prototypes of it. You know, I led the weekly core devs call uh, for a year, taking notes, driving execution. And I think the, the thing that led us to that was um, kind of this belief that if we could scale Ethereum DA, everything else, you know, would be an execution challenge that we could also solve. And so where we are today uh, is we've launched the first phase of that proto dank sharding. Um, you know, we have a target of three blobs a block, which uh, gives us whatever. It's like 384. I forget exactly what the number is. 384 uh, kilobytes a block of space, um, uh, which uh, we, we've basically saturated, although some of the saturation today is uh, inscriptions. Um, and uh, base is obviously using a, a big chunk of that. Now, the really cool thing about uh, 4844 and the first implementation is that it was built in such a way that the interface for layer twos uh, and the, the construct of these blobs uh, is fixed from now on, right? Like that's how layer twos are going to scale. They're going to keep posting more and more blobs as they have more and more execution throughput to this blob space. Um, now, what's going to happen in parallel is Ethereum is going to have to scale the amount of storage that uh, blobs can support. So we're going to have to scale from, you know, 384 kilobytes a block to however many we can. I think Vitalik has a goal of like two mega, megabytes a second. I forget exactly what his goal is. Um, but some goal that's big enough to support the, the scale of throughput that um, uh, we think it's going to take the, the whole world to come on chain, which is a lot of throughput. Um, and so there's, a, there's actually a pretty clear roadmap for, for executing on that. The next big milestone is what's called Pure DAS, uh, which is kind of a... a Kind of, uh, if you think about the um, uh, existing implementation of blob space, uh, every node has every blob. Um, which gives you the blob storage, but doesn't get, give you actually any scalability. Um, it, it's still the same storage requirements, except for we've changed what those storage requirements are. So now nodes only have to store the data for 17 days instead of in perpetuity. So you get some benefits from that in terms of like hardware requirements. What PureDAS is going to do uh, is, is kind of do the first level of uh, scaling, where now behind the scenes, we're actually making it so nodes don't have to store all the data. Uh, and my understanding is that that's what's called like one dimensional uh, data availability sampling, uh, which basically I, I don't honestly really fully understand, but uh, it lets you scale it. Uh, and then that's kind of the the next like, you know, 12, 24 months. And then beyond that, you have full dank sharding, which is two dimensional, which lets you scale it even even more. And I think gets you uh, from like linear scaling to sublinear scaling because you're kind of uh, scaling the sampling in a two dimensional way where as you add more nodes or add more blobs, um, you're, add, you're doing like one half of the work per node. Uh, and so that roadmap, you know, there's still research challenges on it, but um, the, the short term in terms of pure DAS is actually relatively clear. Uh, and so from a base and Coinbase perspective, that's what we're working on. Um, we're going to work on execution scaling, then we're going to work on pure DAS, and then we're going to work on pushing forward the next phase so that by the time we get, you know, one year from now, we'll have pure DAS out, we will be scaling the, the amount of blob storage, uh, and then we'll have the research challenges solved on full dank sharding, and then we'll execute that the year after, and then we'll be kind of in this uh, panacea where we can scale infinitely the, the amount of data that blobs can store. And so I think from where I sit, I have a, a, a pretty clear line of sight for us being able to scale Ethereum data availability to support the scale of base, even as we push to one giga gas a second or more. Um, and I think the, the reason why I say Ethereum data availability specifically is that when we are thinking about building a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom, and we're thinking about building the, the largest on-chain economy in the world that you know I, I think has the potential to be, be larger than many economies that exist today in the world, uh, security and trust is going to be absolutely critical. 
And that's been kind of Coinbase's uh, ethos from the beginning. It's, you know, the most trusted, the easiest to use. And I think as we think about making base both the most trusted and the easiest to use, Ethereum and the data availability and the, the, the kind of consistency of that stack is going to be what enables us to give that trust to our developers, to our customers, to our users, uh, and to uh, kind of build this massive economy that we're trying to build. Now, that's not to say that there aren't going to be other teams, whether it's at L2 or L3, that are making different trust trade-offs. And I think this is where the other data availability layers are going to proliferate. You know, there are going to be all sorts of people who are building all sorts of things on chain that don't that that aren't trying to build the largest economy in the world. And so they might be willing to sacrifice some of that trust, sacrifice some of that security um, because they have less less high requirements. And so I think particularly at L3, this is where we will see a ton of that experimentation. We'll see people use you know data availability committees. We'll see them use Celestia. We'll see them use EigenDA. Um, uh, and I think that that's great. Uh, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but um, I think high level, our, our thesis for base is because we are building the largest on-chain economy in the world, maximizing that trust by um, kind of staying connected and, and staying uh, or, or introducing as few new trust assumptions as possible to our underlying technology stack is super, super important. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, w- while talking about maybe Coinbase and, and you know, trust, I, I want to maybe tie those together uh, and ask two questions. Um, w- one is obviously you guys run the sequencer, which I think makes um, on the order of a million or two million per day um from from fees um i'm curious about two two parts of that it, one is how does coinbase think about base as a business like mm-hmm. do do you guys look at the sequencer fees as like company revenue um and how should other people think about that like going forward obviously at first it needs to be a bit more uh hand you need to hold the hand of the sequencer a bit more as coinbase but then you obviously want to decentralize so how, how should people think about that dynamic and then two is as like um, this this model plays out of like people launching their L2s and capturing sequencer fees um, and then maybe launching L3s, it doesn't seem like there is as much value going back to Ethereum as there used to be. And um, some people will say, well, it's okay because people will use Ethereum as money for those L2s or L3s and hence it should get value that way. How do you think about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, you know, today base is obviously making some revenue. Honestly, we we didn't really anticipate this. Um, you know, I I, I went into like twenty twenty four uh, with four eight four four looming on the the horizon, and we basically modeled all of our fees going to zero because we knew that data availability was going to get driven down. Um, and I think the the rate at which we've seen induced demand, um, where we lowered fees, and then we've seen way 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 more transactions. I think like you know at this point it's like seven eight ten x uh, from where we were before four eight four four has much exceeded our expectations. And so we've just been trying to keep up. Uh, and, and generally, I'd say the way we think about base is our North Star is to drive fees down as low as humanly possible so we can drive as many people on chain as possible. That's it. Like, we do not think about base as a revenue driver. I think Coinbase has always made money by providing really great experiences to users uh, and owning that customer relationship uh, and then kind of charging a tax for that, right? You know, the trading tax, for instance, where, you know, when you make a trade on Coinbase, you pay whatever it is, 1%. Um, and so I think that the thesis with Base is if we create a really incredible developer platform and we make that developer platform proliferate and let people build incredible apps on it and get it in front of millions of users, billions of users, then Coinbase is going to be kind of this this front page um, that everyone's going to access it through. And that's going to be really, really good for Coinbase's business. And so our North Star, our ethos is never like, okay, let's keep you know execution capacity lower so we can make more money. No, it's like, literally, I'm telling the team every single day, it's like, what can we do to scale execution capacity? Because I see people complaining about fees and we need to make them cheaper. Uh, so as we've been a little bit surprised by this, I think we're still a little bit kind of like figuring out what's next. Like, h- how do we think about this? But I'd say the, the primary thing that we're thinking about is how do we take that... Um, uh, kind of financial uh, resources that are that are being generated by us and re- reinvest it back in the ecosystem. Uh, so we just launched gas grants. So if you're a developer uh, and building on base, you can get free gas uh, from pretty much any provider. You can go to Alchemy, you can go to you know Byconomy, you can go to uh, 
Coinbase Cloud. You can go to um, any any provider, and they'll give you free gas to build on base. Um, uh, we're, we're kind of scaling our grants program, uh, where we're looking at the impact that builders make on base, and then giving them proactive uh, uh, grants, basically, where we reach out to them and say, "Hey, you had a big impact. We want to give you money uh, so that you are rewarded for that impact." Um, we're, we're teeing ourselves up for on chain summer too, which is coming this summer, where we're going to be uh, kind of running a whole build a thon for the whole summer and giving people resources to build uh, incredible products, uh, giving people resources is to grow those products so they can actually reach more customers uh, and then rewarding people again for the impact that they're making. And I'd say our our North Star for everything is how do we get more builders? And we see uh, kind of the economic activity here that, that's being generated as a tool for us to kind of funnel those resources back into uh, supporting, attracting, uh, and growing the builder ecosystem on base. Um, so I'm really excited about it. Uh, I think that um, you know what we're seeing is that there's a ton of demand for base uh, and that that you know, pretty quickly, it's establishing itself as the you know largest L2 in the world, uh, and I think that we're really just getting started. If you look at the numbers today, you know, we're still in the hundreds of thousands of people who are transacting daily. We need to get that to billions, and so that's like a thousand x from where we are today. And so, what we are really laser focused on is taking everything we're learning, uh, taking all of the the resources that we have access to, and funneling it into getting more builders who create more incredible product experiences that bring more users on chain. Because we think if we can bring everyone on chain, we're going to be able to increase economic freedom massively. We're going to be able to create a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And we're going to be able to change the world. So I don't know exactly how we'll do it, uh, but I, I know that we've made a huge impact thus far and I can't wait to keep building with everyone. Love the approach and love the ethos, Jesse. And congratulations on the early success. Uh, and thanks again for, for joining us today. It's been a fantastic conversation. Uh, truly a pleasure to, to speak with you. And, you know, uh, we'll put your links in, your social links in the, in the description here as Amazing. well. Definitely give Jesse a follow on Twitter. He's loud and he's passionate. Uh, quite similar to Mert, actually. <laughs> uh, and so it's great to, it's great, great follow as well. But uh, thanks yeah, again, Jesse. It. Well, thanks for having me, guys. This is awesome and uh, excited to keep building with you.